Hello. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, glad to we're, be back. <laughs> we're the grad girls. <laughs> right. So <laughs> we sound well mentally. <laughs> we're evolution's grad girls, and we don't. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this episode, we're going to be um, really honing in on one of my favorite uh, topics, survival of the illest. illest. And not the cool mm-hmm. illest, the actual suffering illest. <laughs> um, so this week, we're going to be talking about um, bad things that happened to us. Um, not exactly all illnesses, but truly on the illest theme, the illest mm-hmm. span, gradation, everything. Um, so we'll be addressing your questions from Reddit and hopefully you like it. Yep. Let's get started. Scotty, take it away. All right. All right. So I have the first question here. And this question is from Explain Like I Five. Um, how are genetic diseases passed on to kids and why? So the answer to this is pretty much that they are passed on from your parents. And pass on just like any other gene, like any gene that I have for having black hair. It comes from my parents. Um, And it's the same thing if I had any diseases that they also had. So my parents or potentially their grandparents or somewhere down my lineage um, had a random mutation. And that caused, I don't know what disease. Everyone in my family kind of has bad eyesight. So so we can talk about that. I wear really thick glasses, but that probably came from somewhere down our family line. Someone might have had a genetic mutation that um, might leave them more predisposed to bad eyesight, needing glasses. And then mutation, as long as it occurs in your germline, which are your eggs and your sperm, um, can be passed on to your offspring. So it can just go away when you have children. Um, it could potentially be recombined out or you could potentially, you know, maybe have a mutation that could correct it again. So I think that is pretty rare for that to happen. Um, but that's pretty much how it happens, right? You just get your genes from your parents, and then any disease they, that they have have a probability of making it down to you as well. Yeah, she's right. I have asthma, and my my mom has asthma, and my brother has asthma. Um, and I think her parents have had asthma. Um, and hopefully... My hypothetical offspring doesn't have it, but yeah, we uh, we just got to deal with it. Um, <laughs> my question's more of an interesting thing than it, it could be an advantage rather than an, an ill thing. Um, so our r slash ask science discussion asks, would more fingers or toes provide any advantage to humans? So yeah, like... Technically, yes, it could be more beneficial to have more fingers and toes, but not so beneficial that Audrey and I possess more fingers and toes than most people do. So if you Mm -hmm. think about it, if it was so beneficial, maybe more of the population would have it. Um, Culturally, it seems to not have been beneficial to where people are like, wow, more fingers and toes, let's do the thing. Um, Mm -hmm. But unfortunately... But I think that there has been a stigma in our many cultures that more fingers and toes can be seen as odd. Um, Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, they didn't get laid for that. Um, But technically, it could be more advantageous, um, but maybe not so much more advantageous that it breaks the barrier of like cultural fitness, if you, I guess, if you think of it that way. Like if we were to perceive it as, as differently than we currently do, maybe more people would have more fingers and toes. Um, And that's just a good example of how evolution isn't always just exactly biologically based. So we have to take into account that maybe Audrey might not have more offspring because she has bad eyesight or I may not have more offspring because I have exercise induced asthma. Um, So it's the kind of same thing like that. Like if there are a stigma against these things that we inherited, we wouldn't be passing them on either. But it seems to be that people with bad eyesight and asthma are just as hot as the regular, uh, everybody else. Um, so fortunately we, we made it this far. Um, but yes, 
more fingers and toes could absolutely provide an advantage, but maybe not so much of a, an advantage to where we all decide we all have more fingers and toes than before. I also just want to add, I think evolution speaking, if I remember correctly, um, the five finger, five toes, like body plan. Yeah. Is generally just kind of, it's been in mammals for a long time. Oh. Yeah. Right. So it's not something that we would just evolve to have suddenly like an extra six oh, no. finger, six toe. Right. Yeah. Um, that is true. So like the classic mammal body plan has not really, uh, changed a lot. So the fact that we do have extra toed, pe- extra hand and toed people to begin with is already very interesting and could potentially even be rare. Like the whole cats having an extra thumb is super cool and very much desired apparently. So mm-hmm. somehow cats broke the barrier culturally as one is trying to snuggle with me right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, so for people, apparently we just have very weird standards about um, fingers and toes and how hot it is. Mm-hmm. Um, The next question is r slash ask science discussion again, and this is going to be like a joint discussion. Um, What evolution would greatly benefit us without having a significant impact on our current appearance as humans? So this is really interesting. I think like what if question. Yeah. So Audrey, please take it away. (laughs) Uh, I don't know. I've been thinking about this question because I think it's interesting to think about like, I don't know if I could just like mutate part of myself into something that I would want. What would it be? I guess like yeah. I, I think of the Naked and Afraid episodes where they have to walk on the ground and it's like excruciating and they cry <laughs> and it's like really, really like the brunt of the issue is that the ground is hard to walk on. So like, this is all speculation, not real, not going to do it, please don't. Um, but if I were to design a harder pad of my foot, maybe that could be cool. Yeah. But would that be, would it, if it were just me, then that would be weird because everybody else would be wearing shoes and I <laughs> wouldn't be. But if it was everyone, then shoe fashion would be obsolete, which is unfortunate because I love me apparently. Yeah, we wouldn't need shoes <laughs> Um... I think it'd be really cool if we could photosynthesize. I would love that. Oh, okay. Well, that's cool. <laughs> Mine's like, yes. Um, that is cool. Well, that's kind of those, if I could just like walk outside and, you know, like get energy from the sun. Feel it out. Which again, it is kind of hard too, because I love food. I love trying different oh, foods. Oh, yeah. And, well, what know, if having like a variety. Like, like a, like when you put your phone on 20%, it's like a little backup, a little something, something. Or like when a, a car is like a hybrid. And you've got that little. Yeah, bit of it's only power. if I want it, if I need it, photosynthesize. That'd be yeah, kind of cool. If it were like really down to the wire, and you're like, oh, let me go get that. <laughs> yeah. And then I think this one. Yeah. Right. Wouldn't it be kind of cool? Because I know I they're know. like. Uh, so unfortunately, like, I have that, but. I think there's. Is it like jellyfish or snails? I've read about some sea creature that when they eat like photosynthetic organisms, they can for a while like maintain the chlorophyll, so they can photosynthesize for a while. Which, that'd be so cool if every time we eat like spinach, like this archaeology thing, you have to just <laughs> take a back seat because whatever that is, <laughs> way more interesting for the time being. Um, and then I think speaking as a population, um, we need to evolve to more like sedentary lifestyle, just because like I feel like our bodies, for the most part, we're kind of stuck in you know the past where we were walking for eight hours in a day yeah. or. Hunting and, and gathering, like always being active. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now, like, I sit in front of the TV, especially during quarantine. I got my computer in front of me, yeah. sitting in front of the TV, like, five hours at a time. Not what they have wanted is, for us, really. No, not what my body's built to do. So I'm not sure what evolution, what evolutionary yeah. feature that would be, but something that could help us adapt Thank better you. to a more sedentary lifestyle. Yeah. Mm. Okay, fantasy round. What, what do you want that's not reasonable? <laughs> <laughs> um, I already came up with the photosynthesis thing. No, that's cool. I'm on a fantasy round. Something that has nothing to do like actual benefit, like not like biological benefit, just like for personal gain. Oh. If my hair could go blue naturally, that would save me a lot of money. <laughs> a lot of money and time and effort if my hair would just grow blue already. 
but I, I can't say that's the fantasy round one because this is, I, I, I gotta, I gotta go hard, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, if I could, if I could grow my limbs back, that could be cool. Yeah. No, that would be amazing. But that's, yeah, you know, I don't know. I can't think of anything too fantastical. I guess I'm just yeah, too <laughs> Well, the question also says it shouldn't have a significant impact on our appearance. Oh. So I can't really say we, should, we shouldn't have, like, I don't know, stone skin or... Dang it. Okay. <laughs> well, if I didn't have IBS, maybe that would be my... <laughs> if we were less prone to, like, digestive issues, that could be really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would be great, too. If I didn't have IBS and lactose intolerance, then my life would be really good. <laughs> Sorry, viewers. That's my main issue. <laughs> Exercise-induced asthma, I can, I can hit that little inhaler, and I'm good. But but that other stuff, it's a little more complicated. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> I think I'd like to... I also like the... You know how frogs, or I think some other animals, they have, like, that membrane that goes over their yes. eyes when they go underwater? I would love that. Okay, okay. This is my time to shine. <laughs> my stepdad, my I'm from Louisiana, so like should be different there than like the city. So my stepdad and my my mom, of course, are like all always outside, always like doing a bunch of crazy stuff with animals, just like just like you know Steve Irwin type of people. Um, and eventually, my stepdad started to show like some kind of like. Mem- like some kind of like some texture under the lights of his eyes and my mom was kind of getting like freaked out about it um and eventually it was starting to get more texture and like more like surface area was being covered um she and my of course my stepdad's brother is a doctor because they live in a small town so you know he gets to, he gets to get to the front of the line and it turns out that it is an adaptation to where if you're getting a lot of debris like mm-hmm. it's sun exposure, wind exposure, and debris is like how it usually comes. Your eye will grow some kind of like extra gunk to like oh. protect yourself. And if and like the the current uh, treatment plan is that if it is so bad that it starts to cover his entire like his people and everything, mm-hmm. we would have to just well, not. I would not have to, of course, but emotionally I would be supporting him in that situation but he would have to get it like scraped off and removed so you say that but like fuck if I thought that was a real thing but before five years ago <laughs> yeah, no, that's really it's not the same thing strange. it's very very interesting it's very weird yeah, no, that is super interesting yeah so like we I don't obviously have, don't swim enough for that to happen. We don't like we don't like work hard enough <laughs> for that happens. Speaking of like us like not being truly adapted to what we were supposed to be, we would never have that weird eye thing because we never are outside enough. But my yeah. stepdad does and my mom doesn't. So I guess she's taken the easy road. I mean, not that she's not a hard worker or anything, but for some reason she doesn't have it. Um but yeah, like how crazy is that? Yeah, it could technically obstruct his view, but I I wonder if that and this is this this question cannot be answered. But I I deeply wonder if that is something that our ancestors would have experienced because of course their life in direct sunlight and direct elements and like debris and things. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. It, I mean, if Russell's got it, they must have. <laughs> mm-hmm. So the the running joke in our family is Russell has alligator eyes which is ironic because he works with alligators a lot. Oh, wow. So, um, I know. He's starting to, he's <laughs> taking this them is, on. They're becoming part of Yeah. He, <laughs> speaking of like existing near a species and gaining their like skills and their cool stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, I mean, maybe you and I just have to go out into the elements until we get it, but who knows? So that's my. I don't think, no, that's, that's not the way I want it to happen. <laughs> Well, he didn't, but he didn't like expose himself to anything he wasn't like consensually willing to do, right? Mm, um, right. He just has a different like lifestyle than we do. Um, but yeah, that's a uh, that's my fun fact and my fun story yeah, for the very cool fun episode. Fact. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, if you see that and it's starting to look kind of creepy, go to your doctor. And if it's covering your eye, maybe that's not, mm. you might have you to get it taken care of at that point. Yeah. And that's my medical advice for the episode. (laughs) 
Well, there you go, all our viewers. All our viewers, be careful. Your eye gunk. Maybe <laughs> take some. Take a couple days easy inside. Okay, got it. All right. So let me take it to the next question. And um, so this question asks. Can evolution make some organisms have beneficial mutations, but not the most beneficial mutation? And then their explanation here, um, if an organism mutates in some way that's beneficial to its survival, but it's far from the most efficient way to do it, will the species get the mutation or not? He asks, what if that mutation stops a different one from taking place that would help something even more? Um, so I think the way this question is asked kind of goes into a little bit of what we talked about the basics as well. Like evolution doesn't have like a, an end goal. Um, it's not like a sentient being where it's choosing like, oh, that's the best. It should have that. Um, it's really just working off of what's happening in the environment at the moment. Um, so yes, answering this question is yes. Evolution can make some organisms have some beneficial mutations but it might not necessarily be the best. It's just whatever the organism can use to survive. So if they can live long enough to reproduce, that's all it really needs. Um, and then this question about what if that mutation stops a different one from taking place that would help even more. Um, again, I don't think it really matters as long as that organism has whatever it needs to reproduce and pass on its genes to the next generation. Um, that could be what ends up, uh, you know, get it really spreading in the population. So it doesn't have to be this like end all be all, the best mutation ever in the population. Um, yeah. And I should also say like evolution usually happens in incremental steps, right? You don't automatically see like, um, what is it? I think like the most common biological example is those moths, right? The moths, I think they're like white peppered moths. Yeah. Um, and then once Europe started getting all smoggy from all our factories and the Industrial Revolution, um, the darker colored moths became a lot more prevalent. But that didn't happen, you know, in the span of like a week, right? It took many years for eventually the white ones to be eaten away and then the black ones to reproduce. So it's this incremental change. And we can't really know at the time, like, what's going to be the most beneficial mutation since the environment's always changing. Yeah, and I think we're we should we're thankful that we know so many. There are so many species on Earth that have a lifespan less than us because we can watch them live through. Yeah, we right. just happen to live long as heck and can't see our own cool stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the study species where this is like really well exemplified are just species who live less long than us, less less time, less long. <laughs> it's not long animals. Um, they live less than us, less time than us. So like. Darwin's finches, they have different lifespans. Therefore, we can track and see their things. But the likelihood that we get grants for like a multi-generational study of humans, scientists, is just super low. So these studies are really cool because we can observe these really cool processes, but they're definitely not conscious. Like they're only so conscious as me telling you don't procreate with somebody who has asthma, right? Like, and that's not gonna really do anything because if one person listens to my my advice which is not good advice and unreasonable advice then that's not consciously changing the human population that's just constantly changing mm -hmm. your life history um, yeah, exactly. or not your life history but your life choices and that offspring's uh, capability to have asthma but then again do you really know your lineage and the pre prevalence of asthma in your family so even mm -hmm. if you listen to my stuff it's not really going to change anything probably and are you going to pass on your asthma hating propaganda to your child? Who's to say? Um, but yeah, we can't think of evolution as a conscious, pro conscious process. And I think that's one of the things that is the most difficult to show people um, mm -hmm. is that no one, even now that we are like smart or something, no one is thinking about this type of thing uh, when they fall in love or, or have a baby mm -hmm. for whatever reason. No one's really considering right. that. Um, the only evolution that's a conscious pro process, even like the only thing I can think of is us domesticating animals, but they mm -hmm. don't even get the consent to that. So that still doesn't count. Yeah. All right. And then, oh, yes, this next question is, 
asking also from our social evolution. And it is asking why don't humans or basically any animal develop resistance to diseases since we've been suffering from them since the inception of humankind? Um, so the answer here is that we are building the resistance. We have built some resistance. The diseases do the same thing, right? So as we evolve, so are the diseases, so are bacteria. Um, and then actually for them, it might be a little bit easier. They have, for the most part, such quick lifespans where they're constantly yeah. um, dividing and making new bacteria. And with cell division, every cell division could result in another new mutation. And so while we're dividing and growing relatively slowly, bacteria can do it in like the span of a few hours or in the span of a few days. Um, so as quick as we are trying to develop our medicines, trying to develop our own resistance, bacteria are doing the same thing against us. And so yeah. if you've ever heard that like evolutionary arms race, that's exactly what's happening with disease. Right? So they're trying to keep up with our defenses as much as we're trying to defend against them. Yeah, and they're living in some sense like us, right? Their their goal is to come for us and and survive and pass on to the next thing. Coronavirus is a great example. Like if coronavirus never existed before now, how could I have built up a resistance to that? Um, and it just constantly changing. And humans are not the only people, the only species on earth to get diseases. There are plenty of other animals that are susceptible to diseases as well and have yet to like just figure it out. You know, they, they don't become resistant mm -hmm. to it. And, and there really is never going to become a point in time in which any species is going to be completely resistant to anything. Like we, we have big fear of like super uh, diseases and viruses are like becoming resistant to anti antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Like if, if that's something I think that people can relate to really well is like, okay, well every flu season is a little bit different. Um, kind of how like coronavirus didn't exist. For a while before now um so like we're always going to be on the response and on the defense we're never going to really be on the offense side so it's like there's no way for us even to predict how it's going to go um and of course there's still modern limitations to medicine uh but especially without medicine we don't have a chance <laughs> like there's no way my body is just going to naturally become um adapted to any of these things Thankfully, we have medicine to help, mm -hmm. uh, but even then, it's still not perfect. Um, so it's a really good example of how like diseases and viruses and bacteria are just as in the game of evolution as any of the rest of us, although they're very different from us. They actually sometimes are a little more interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, this is one of my favorite questions. Um, and, and when I say favorite questions, I never mean to judge or to guilt. I just love that someone like, this is a really good question. And like, sometimes they're asked in kind of strange ways, but like, this is like fantastic. Um, were human babies ever capable of, this is on r slash um, evolution, sorry guys. Were human babies ever capable of surviving on their own like Tarzan? And of course, like my main source is DisneyFandom.com wiki slash Tarzan. <laughs> um, but no, Tarzan's not real. Um, thankfully. Uh, because that would really throw a wrench in the whole idea of how we see things in nature. Um, but primate babies are not capable of surviving on their own either. Like no baby is really adapted at all to survive on their own. Um, like I can't, like not even the little turtles that just hatch and go out to sea. Like they're not even completely like capable. Um, we should just be thankful we're still alive, honestly, because our parents are so charitable to keep us around. Um, but Tarzan is admittedly described as someone who possesses capabilities beyond a normal human, even in infancy. So he's kind of like a, a super soldier. Superhuman. Superhuman <laughs> as a baby. Um, also, another primate would never really adopt a surrogate human baby. At, like in response, of course, to their own babies being taken. I mean, like we do see interspecies adoption, um, but this is a fictional movie that goes really far beyond the circumstances of reality. Like mm -hmm. technically speaking, yeah, uh, maybe they would take a little baby and hang out with it, but they would likely not be able to care for it in the same ways that 
we could have the knowledge to care about primate babies. Like my, my sweet friend, our sweet friend, Rachel studies lactation and nutrition in milk and things like gorillas would not even have the right milk to provide for a human baby, much less know what little snacks it might like. It's like gorillas eat like nettles, like no human babies munching on some nettles. <laughs> like e even if the gorilla had the foresight to plan a meal prep for a baby, I don't think that even then it could even really do anything for this baby to survive, much less for this baby to live on its own and survive. But yeah, Disney really threw that one uh, into our faces. But there is like interspecies adoptions. There are like stories and there are studies about animals who adopt adopt other animals that are kind of like in a set like they're kind of like each other, like a fox and a kitten or something. Mm -hmm. Not like two, di like it's not like a snake's gonna adopt a kitten though. It's got to be kind of like in the same realm of reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not gonna be too crazy. But yeah, Tarzan, Tarzan's not real, one. And and no baby should be in that situation, too. Three, it also admits that it has superhuman capabilities and that he is not like a regular human. So whatever um, whatever genes he has, we should be going for, um, if that were possible. But unfortunately, no human babies were ever capable until they're not really babies anymore. Yeah. And then the next question is r slash biology. What is the evolutionary advantage of having feelings? Um, as a very, very emotional person question. myself, uh, I will vouch that feelings are a great thing. Uh, but not all of us are so in tune with our crazy side. So maybe someday you'll see it. You'll come to see what <laughs> I have to say about this. Um, I personally like to think of feelings as an extension of our sensory experience. So if you've ever been in a, in a situation where you experience like a really compelling gut sensation of fear, maybe listen to it, right? Like if I'm, if I'm walking alone in a dark alleyway to my parked car, I might have fear because I am not really aware of my surroundings. I may not have anything with me to prepare myself for any negative thing to happen to me. Um, I may not have cell service. I may not have any really way of getting out of dangerous situation. You could think of that similarly to how maybe uh, our extinct relatives would experience fear if they did not have the luxury of a, a parked car and a phone, but like they likely experienced a lot of moments where they're like, okay, I have not yet, I, I'm not prepared for the situation. So I am a little afraid of what could happen. Mm -hmm. um, everybody may, not everyone will consider you know, that gut feeling integral to survival, but fear particularly can benefit an organism from running into trouble. So we, there's a lot of studies of like really simple organisms um, retracting away from something. So like in, in vegans as well have a great way of understanding this is like one of our friends is vegan and she only eats stuff that she knows has no response to stimuli, mm -hmm. which is technically you could kind of lump those two arguments together. It's like if I didn't respond to stimuli, what I, I wouldn't have emotions either. Um, some st people study emotions by using emotional behavior as a means of like indexing circuits in your brain that have evolved to allow organisms to deal with challenges and opportunities in their environment. Similarly, how my friend doesn't eat anything if it responds to stimuli. These, this study is like, okay, well, what does this response to stimuli really mean in terms of your brain? Um, but inversely, emotions like love or care can aid in building a community or reproductive relationship. So like we can think of fear as an incredible way of not dying. Um, we can think of uh, fear also as like, oh, I remembered a situation in which this was really not cool. I'm not gonna do that again. Or we could think of positive feelings like love, community, uh, friendship as a really great help to our social structure. So I know my cats love each other. So they don't want to kill each other. I know that they like to snuggle and that may provide them a good sense of security when the dog next door is barking really loud and scaring them or when we moved here and they were in a crate and like, what the heck is going on? So I, I argue that there is a great emotional, there is a great advantage evolutionarily to having feelings. But I think that 
the way that humans see feelings is not really the full spectrum of feelings that exist in the animal kingdom. Mm -hmm. Um, so I implore you to reconsider, you know, Hey, if you're getting shady feelings, talking to somebody or going into some situation, maybe listen to them. Maybe it's your Mm -hmm. ancestors saying this ain't going to be cool. (laughs) Um, speaking of feelings, uh, r slash evolution asks, homosexuality has been recorded in many species and is mostly agreed that there is some benefit, but could it be something else? Um, as a bi person in science, I would say homosexuality is a benefit because I have benefit from it before. Um, but sex is not only for reproduction. Mm-hmm. I admittedly have had sex before and have not reproduced. Um, I seem to be doing okay. Um, we as humans are a really great model of how sex does not eat the baby. Um, and the same with like fixed animals. Like how many times have your like neutered or spayed creatures tried to have sex with another object? They don't have babies and they still try to do it. Um, many if not most animals engage in same sex activity for reasons like diffusing aggression to simple just sexual pleasure like any of the rest of us do. Mm-hmm. Sometimes this can be a result of not enough males to mate with in your social circle or due to different social structures and animals in general. Like we know that bonobo females get it on and they have a great time. They seem to be very happy. Mm -hmm. We know that humans actively have birth control is a great example. We actively have sex a lot and we don't always have a baby from that. So if you think of uh, it that way, you know, it's a good, it's a good argument. We do also know that whales, elephants, it's almost like every animal seems to have same-sex behaviors, but all of a sudden in the human world, it's like a weird thing. So I think this is a great example of how our cultural stuff really plays into our biological reality. So culturally Mm -hmm. speaking, it could have been taboo, and unfortunately still is in some places, to have same-sex relationships or sexual encounters However, in the animal kingdom, um, they are very progressive and they've been doing it forever and we'll probably still be doing it and there's really nothing we can do about it and we shouldn't want to do anything about it. It's actually very interesting. If you want to go into a deep YouTube rabbit hole, um, please do join me in that Um, because for some reason we've just decided it's a rarity, but that's not true at all. Um, Mm -hmm. It's a rarity that things are truly uh, heterosexual all the time. So it's interesting that it's the inverse, but our cultural perception probably guides us to some strange things sometimes. Yeah, and I think it goes back to that previous question too, just of like, is it the the most beneficial mutation or most beneficial whatever, right? So not everything has to have some kind of evolutionary advantage, which seems to be kind of like what this question is inferring, but yeah, maybe there's no evolutionary advantage to homosexuality, uh, but why not? You know, if it's not hurting us, I wouldn't yeah. be there. Yeah. yeah. And, and like, if you think, but then again, you also can't think of everything as like biological reproduction is the main goal. Mm-hmm. The organism has to have a good time. It's life, right? That's the whole point. Um, but mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, there are some advantages like diffusing situations or um, really building relationships, but not everything is um, biological reproductive in game, right? Like. Mm-hmm. An organism just has to have a good time, and the, as they should. <laughs> and our last question for today goes to Audrey. Yes, so rounding it out, this question asks, uh, why did humans not evolve to have sharp teeth? Um, and this is from r slash biology, and their continuation of this question. So humans have been bipedal for basically all of their existence. They have or had no dominating natural weapons other than their intelligence, from an evolutionary standpoint, wouldn't sharp teeth have been a favorable trait? Is it because of their diet? Um, and then a little side question at the end here, just by the way, I think life would be different if humans had sharp teeth. Um, so it's an interesting question, I think, and I, but I do think that it's not exactly correct to say that we've had no dominating natural weapons. Um, because, I mean, humans have been shown to have been using tools for quite a long time. Um, I think you would know better than me, Kristen, but the oldest tools are... (laughs) We've been having tools more than we've been having humans, deeply. 
like if you think about it, humans like Homo sapien is just a very small portion of the record in which we are having tools, um, much mm-hmm. less like hunting tools, right? Like we had hunting tools before us. So yet another time that we're not the coolest. Um, <laughs> so yeah, like, and even if we didn't have hunting tools, we could have had large cutting tools like hand axes, or we just should have just bopped it. <laughs> we should just push something or break it and it just come apart. There's plenty of evidence of tools that could be hunting or cutting or any of these things before humans. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. And then, so if there, you're talking about the diet angle um, in this question as well. So um, part of it is probably that we are, we're not really carnivorous, we're omnivores. And we evolved from a lineage of mostly herbivorous animals. So if you look at the lineage that contains, you know, gorillas, chimps, they're eating plants, they're eating fruits. Um, occasionally they're eating meat, but again, yeah, pretty, they didn't very, evolve. Really. Right. They didn't evolve to be hunting and eating meat for most of their diet. Yeah. Um, and the reason why they have sharp teeth is because that's how they, you know, fight for dominance. Right? Yeah. Like, like our, our gorillas. Fight each other. Yeah, exactly. Like, why do gorillas have sharp teeth if not to eat meat? Well, there's a lot of things that we have that are not just restricted to one area of our life, right? I don't So it's have... more sexual selection happening yeah. there. Yeah. Um, whereas in humans, I mean, from what it seems like to me, we have developed other ways. Um, I feel like our sexual selection maybe happens in different ways. I don't know too much about what we know. Um, about the evolution of that because you know that's very it's very difficult to discern behavior from fossils yeah i mean some Uh, people are still really into sharp teeth but uh, apparently not so much that we (laughs) we kept them but by the time that we had less sharp teeth um i mean we we lost that a bit ago you know like it it wasn't like we lost them incredibly recently um it's not like it was a synonymous with the time that we started hunting or we had spears or anything um these things happen over time and i think we lost sharp teeth really before we even had tools but that says a lot about our omnivorous uh past and our omnivorous ancestors so um something i i will say is like a lot of these questions are really great because i think a lot of people think that one equals another so sharp teeth equals diet or sharp teeth equals sexual selection. But in reality, it's, it's a response to many different pressures in all different directions acting in many different parts of an organism's lives. So um, that's why we have to look at things so holistically. That's why we have to look at things with a lot of interdisciplinary aspects. And that's why we have to work together because sometimes the answer is really creative and you need some people to just use that big brain energy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a great ending point there. Great ending point. Work together. Yeah. Don't be so worried about same sex stuff. Um, <laughs> let your heart decide what you're going to be doing next. Um, mm-hmm. And next time you watch a Disney film, be a little more skeptical about that organism, the human organism growing up. Yeah. <laughs> Those are our takeaways for today. Also, if you've got weird <laughs> eye stuff, maybe ask someone about it. But honestly, mm-hmm. you're probably very cool. Um, in my eyes, if you have the weird eye thing, um, please email me if you have the weird eye thing <laughs> at evolutionsbradgirls at gmail.com. Please email me. Um, I'd love to hear about your tales with your eyes. Um, but yeah, that's the end of this week. Uh, we'll be, we will be dropping open access free articles, uh, time stamped in the description box. We will be getting back to you soon with our episode of past, present, and future. So the grass very serious. Grass animals, we'll see you soon. We wish you well. Stay home within reason. Um, stay healthy. Stay healthy. Stay emotional. Stay woke with your emotions. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you.